committee minutes of December 18. So and, moved. Um, Rick has moved and I will second. Oh, and then there's a, there's a correction. On page three, I believe. On page three, I think. Uh, who, who took note of what that correction was? I didn't. Uh, let me see. I, I know what it is, Commissioner. Well, uh, on page three, the first line, it says despairing cost. And the words should be corrected to read what? Decoupling. Yes, decoupling, I believe. Uh, yes. With that, um, I, I move. Subject to that um, change. Um, we are in agreement that the minutes are approved. Commissioner Nelson? Yes, I, I vote to support. All right, approval. and so do I. Uh, the first, the next item on our agenda is an update and some action required on Hillendale Gateway the former Holly Hall site. And um, Kareem, who's going to be? Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Um, for the record, my name is Kareem Brown, uh, Deputy Executive Director. And um, in a minute, I'll turn this over to Catherine Hollister, who will lead the discussion, which um, seeks the committee's support and staff's recommendation to the commission uh, to approve the selection of Renaissance Inc. as the demolition contractor for the um, buildings currently at Holly Hall. And Holly Hall is the uh, site on which the redevelopment will, or the development of Hillendale Gateway will occur. And for that to occur, the, um, the buildings currently will need to be demolished. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Catherine Hollister and um, she'll leave the discussion. <clears throat> Catherine Hollister, I'm a senior financial analyst in the real estate division. As Karen mentioned, uh, this item is regarding Helen Bell Gateway, specifically the approval to select Renaissance Inc. as the demolition contractor for Holly Hall Apartments in accordance with information for bid number 2222 an authorization for the executive director to negotiate and execute a contract for the demolition. Page 10 of the packet is the executive summary. As Karen mentioned, Holly Hall Apartments uh, is the future development site of Hill and Bell Gateway, a new 463 unit mixed use, mixed income, multi-generational community. Holly Hall is currently vacant and the three buildings on the site have reached the end of their useful life cycles. HOC is seeking the services of a demolition contractor to demolish the existing buildings and prepare the site for redevelopment. On November 4th, 2020, the commission approved a budget and funding for the demolition of Holly Hall. On December 8th, 2020, HOC issued IFB number 2222 and bids were opened on January 6, 2021. Pursuant to the IFB, the contract will be awarded to the responsive and responsible bidder offering the lowest base bid. A responsive bid means that it meets the criteria laid out in the IFB, and a responsible bidder demonstrates that it has the experience and qualifications to perform the requirements of the contract, patient and financial requirements of IFB number 2222. Renna said also offered the lowest bid of $379,950. The award of IFB number 2222 will be made from funds approved by the commission on November 4th, 2020. Page 11, provides a location map and photos of the Holly Hall site. Page 12 highlights the key dates relative to IFB number 2222. Page 13 provides a summary of HSE's procurement policy regarding invitations for bids. In the case of the demolition of Holly Hall, we had a well-defined scope of work. So an IFB would allow HSE to award a fixed price contract to the qualified and responsive bidder offering the lowest price. Page 14 provides a summary of the scope of work. 
and some of the requirements of the IFB. Notable responsibilities include demolishing Holly Hall apartments down to sub grade, water and sewer disconnections, vert inspection and treatment, removal and abatement of hazardous materials, pulling permits, achieving a 20% MFD participation, and complying with all federal, federal, state, and local regulations. The scope of work specifically excludes gas, electrical, and communication utility disconnections and site fencing, which would be the responsibility of HOC. Page 15 provides a summary of the bids to IFB number 2222. HOC re received 12 bids ranging in price from $379,950 to $820,000. All bids are listed in the chart to the right in the order in which they were opened. Renison Inc. highlighted in green provided the lowest bid. The award of IFB number 2222 will be made from funds approved by the commission on November 4th, 2020. The approved demolition budget is, so, is shown in the chart at the bottom of the slide. Page 16 provides background on Renaissance and highlights examples of their demolition work. Renaissance specializes in structural demolition, selective demolition, abatement services, and recycling. Renaissance is headquartered in Annapolis, Indianapolis, Indiana, with regional offices in Washington, D.C., and Nashville, Tennessee. Renaissance is a certified women owned business. And for the demolition of Holly Hall, Renaissance has proposed subcontracting 20% of its work to two Maryland based MVEs, NVCON Services and CBY Enterprises. Page 17 lists the issues for consideration. Uh, the item is Will the Development and Finance Committee join staff's recommendation to the Commission to select the Renaissance Inc. as the demolition contractor for Holly Hall in accordance with IFB number 2222? and authorize the executive director to negotiate and execute a contract for $379,950 with Renison to complete the demolition of Holly Hall Apartments. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I'm delighted to see that this is a minority owned business and that um, they have been successfully um, competing. So, um, and, and that they're going to also subcontract to two Maryland. Yes. MBEs. Um, based on all of that, I would, uh, move to support the staff request. I second that motion. Well, happy new year. Happy new year. Commissioner Priest has joined us. Um, it's been moved and seconded. Are there any questions of the staff? Hearing none, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 The motion aye. is approved. And aye. thank you it, very much. Madam Chair, if I could, um, this is just, it's not a question about the motion, but it is interesting to me to have such a wide range of bids between <laughs> 373 dollars to $820,000 and I often wonder who reads these scopes of work uh, so to get that much disparity in uh, and I, 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 occasions I have even gone and talked to the high, the high bidder about what were they looking at? Because when, when, just a, just a curiosity to know, what, I mean, what is it that, you know, maybe you can tell by the bid itself, but it just, it's interesting to me when you get that wide range of, of bids. It was wide, extraordinarily so. Well, let's move on. Well, well in following up, was there any follow up with any of those bidders to try to ascertain what their uh, issues were, Catherine? No, not not with the the higher bidders. Um, we evaluated the proposals for for some of the lowest, most competitive bids. But I, I think it's a great idea to reach out and to see, um, you know, why their bids came in so high, or if there was a misunderstanding of the scope of work. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, because in fact, you also have like three of them that it's not just one outlier. Yeah. There are two or three of them that are up there in the 800,000 range. So it would be useful. Okay. Good point, Roy. Okay. Well, let's move on to our next item on the agenda, which is the prospective HOC headquarters yeah. development. And um, this next item will be discussed by uh, Jay Shepard and, and Zach Marks. And 
It requests authorization to transmit to the Planning uh, Commission the second phase of the mandatory referral um, application and um, an approval of the revised uh, FY21 pre-development budget, as well as funding um, of another installment for, of pre-development funds. Um, Jay, please begin your discussion. And, you. um, we'll Excuse me just a moment. Rick, I need to step away for a moment. Would you take over oh. till I return? All right, thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Jay Shepard. It's um, January 22nd, 2021. Happy New Year. Um, this is the authorization we're going to discuss today regarding the transmission to planning, as Karen said, of the second phase of the mandatory referral submission for our HOC HQ building. And uh, we've also revised our 20, F121 uh, pre development budget. And in, in doing so, uh, also updated the pre-development funding requests that we're, we're going to need to make that third installment. Um, and I'll just walk through the packet, which starts on page 18. Uh, and so, Nico, you're, you're showing that, correct? Okay. I see it moving. Uh, great. Okay. So in on page uh, 20 of the executive summary, uh, this, this is about a half acre site that we've identified. It's been in front of the commission before. Um, that sits at the north uh, southeast corner of Fenwick and Second, right across from the Elizabeth Square um, developments that we're undertaking. Uh, it also sits between the Cameron Street Garage and the Octave. Um, there are uh, our other neighbors. Um, in August of last year, we submitted the first of the two-step process for the mand mandatory referral process which was the location review decision. And that was submitted in August. Uh, it was reviewed by uh, staff and then by the planning board and unanimously un un approved on October 15th. Um, that's an easy word to say on Friday mornings. <laughs> um, and, and so now where we've been readying, we, we uh, received some feedback uh, during that process and we've built that feedback into the design. And the second phase is your design phase uh, as well as the uh, administrative subdivision lot uh, for the building. And so in, we're gonna walk through the, what the feedback was, how our design responded to that feedback uh, and then we're going to walk through the budget uh, as well. And so, um, but the staff will be requesting an update to the budget, uh, approval to submit our, our design application, and then uh, walk through the, the additional steps uh, that are coming in front of the planning board uh, later in the packet. Uh, so if we go to the, that slide, um, page 21 of your packet, uh, as part of the re location review plan, uh, we did receive some feedback and the feedback was incorporated into the design, as I mentioned. Uh, this allowed, th this really, one, the slide here on the right really shows the response. Um, we, can, we can actually build on this based on the zoning up to 145 feet. But in doing so, we recognize that, that there were uh, th there were some implications to the neighbors um, with, 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 that, uh, with that full build out. And so the massing responded, um, it, it changed the heights of the first and second floor uh, and it did some carve outs, really sculpting the building back uh, to allow light and view sheds to still occur uh, to, to the neighboring property. Um, while also obviously meeting the needs that we needed um, for, for, the, for our own need uh, here in the building. So we, we were allowed, we, we basically still are capturing the amount of square footage that we needed and maximizing <laughs> that, uh, but, but we're not utilizing the entirety of the, the massing that could have been occurred, but that's okay. Um, it, it, it was very responsive and, and well-received, um, that, that approach, and so uh, so, so that helped with the, um, the consent. <coughs> the other items that we had made was to show where our uh, access to the building would occur, uh, as well as some of the street improvements that were consistent with the Silver Springs 
Silver Spring Habitat Corridor and along Second Avenue, which is a pedestrian corridor, which um, allows folks to really travel down to the metro. Um, and so there was there was concern there as to how the building responded and what the streetscape would look like um, to, to allow for safety of pedestrians and cyclists. Um, the, the slide 22 just discusses the mandatory referral application process and we're in step two right now. Uh, and so we've already had the community meeting um, to listen and which was primarily populated by the residents of the octave. Uh, and, um, and, and so we're, we've, we've taken, we've shown them some of the preliminary designs that we've been, uh, we're, and the stage that the building's in. So on page 24 of the application, oh, sorry, of the packet, uh, shows us the renderings that now we have. Um, it, it does show that first floor at 18 feet. The second floor is a 16 foot floor to floor height. And then floors uh, three through nine are 14 feet. The top floor is a, the ninth floor is really an amenity floor with a rooftop uh, patio terrace. Uh, and it steps back in off that edge of the building to create that rooftop terrace. Um, and it also has a, two step backs at the third floor. Uh, that was really responsive to provide light and, and a view corridor from the, build, the residents there, the octave out onto Fenwick Avenue. And it steps back off sixth street, uh, at the sixth floor off second Avenue uh, to really give the building less of a, a dominant feel over that street uh, as well. And so those were the carve outs that we had made. Um, if you go to slide 25, it shows uh, the service corridor between the two buildings um, and, and consideration has been made for lighting in that space um, as well as for function. Um, we, we've also been looking very closely at the lobby, uh, which you can see is the large glass, glass openings uh, there on the first floor and second floor. Uh, the hearing room is on the second floor as well. Um, there's also been consideration for the facade treatment. Uh, and right now it's being considered as terracotta, uh, a terracotta type of, of facade, but um, we are looking at some options that would give us that same feel that might might be uh, more cost effective, um, though that's not been decided. Um, as we get into uh, further design, there will be some value engineering that will occur. Uh, but but generally, the, you know, it's going to be these these colors in this in this range. Um, and that was, that was generally to be consistent with the neighbors as well as the, the neighboring um, Elizabeth Square property as well. Uh, hey, Jake, look, question. Yes. Uh, is, yeah. is, is the element on the left side there, which is a kind of orange panel, is that just facade or is there a functional use of that space? That's just facade. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it could have, so if you go to actually the next slide, slide 26, um, yeah, it's, it's really just a facade treatment. Uh, it, it could have been the lighter color or it could have been the clay color. Um, and, and they were just playing with it. To, and it really does, if you, if you, it kind of breaks it up and it makes it not feel as heavy and, and, um, and, and as tall uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and so yeah, those are, just, those are just how they're dealing with the, with the color. But it, that, that back, that back first floor has really been, um, it, there's a lot of functions going on in that, in that area. And so they, there's a lot of thought as to how, uh, how, how that inter integrates with the street. Um, if you look at slide 27, uh, th this is generally kind of where they're landing, um, where we're landing basically that there's there's a lot of glass to allow for a lot of light into the main spaces where people aggregate. Um, and that's the lobby, the entrance to the service center, uh, as well as the hearing room, which is there on the second floor facing uh, Second Avenue. You can see that roll of glass um, that extends there. So that's kind of how they're, they're treating that. The next slide, slide 28, 
shows the current layout of the interior and this we'd like this will be in, included in the packet um, for the submission it does show the, the functionality of coming into the lobby uh, how you're getting from the lobby up uh, well obviously into the service center which is there on the right the double set of doors um, so it has an interior access from the lobby uh, there's also elevator access uh, down that hallway with restrooms uh, and some counseling rooms uh, on this main floor. The lobby is going to, we're, we're, we're working through some, some ways that the lobby can really be, um, you know, clean and organized that it can, it can al allow people to gather and wait for appointments um, and, and really be functional from a security perspective. Um, and, and so the area there to the right shows the lobby as it goes up the grand staircase and, and allow folks to get to the second floor. And the second floor is really where all the, uh, the hearing related activities are occurring, the pre-function space, the actual hearing space, and then the space where the commissioners, um, you know, where, where there'll be some office space for you guys. Okay, uh, question, what kind of, uh security do you have in terms of access to the second floor or to the other areas? Uh, the, if, well, the, the lobby, well, the elevators will have card access. So to get to the second floor, you're gonna have to have uh, some kind of way to uh, operate the elevator to get you up there. And we'll have to work through how that's gonna function. Um, but the, the staircase is open um, it's basically open. They can go up and go in. Now that only allows you to get into the pre-function space, which is at the top of the stairs. And it doesn't allow you to get into the hearing room. Uh, those will all be uh, card readed access only points of entry. Um, and there'll be a security guard at that front, right in, on the left-hand side where there's the uh, two chairs that's really sit underneath the stairs going up. Uh, one of those is the main receptionist and the other is the security um, as, as currently conceived. Um, but they would be checking folks in through some uh, sort of process. Um, it, it would be most likely um, iPad, you know, where, where you register and you come in uh, and you can, um, we, we know who's coming in, how they're, and where they're going in the building. That's the general thought. Okay. Um as I look at the waiting room, um, as I have visited a number of public agencies, that is not a very, in, in my opinion, a very um, welcoming waiting area. Uh, rows of seats when mothers are there with small children waiting sometimes considerable time. Um, there's nothing there to engage children that I, I can see from the plan as it's drawn. And it makes for chaos. I've been in a lot of waiting rooms where mothers and children have waited a considerable period of time and the children get very restless and disruptive and I've seen one agency tell a mother to go home and come back when she can control her children. And I think we are really testing and setting up some potentially stressful situations. And I would like to see that, um, particularly with COVID, we're learning that rows of people close together don't make good sense either. And so I would hope that we could look at that and try and make it a little more family friendly because if mothers have to bring children with them, um, it's gonna be an uncomfortable period of time, whatever the amount of time is. So I would hope we could break that up a little bit and find a way. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that comment. And I'll certainly pass that along to the design team. I, I do know when they when they show seating like this um, that they're really doing head count. They're kind of doing what's the capacity of that particular space to hold seating. 
not so much as, hey, this is your furniture plan, you should buy these number of seats, et cetera. Um, th th there is that. Uh, they just want to know how, how big is that area? How could it, how many folks could it hold? Um, but we're nowhere near uh, laying out yet how, how those chairs should be organized. Um, but I hear you, there, there's certainly a need for uh, uh, an, an engagement type process and then, uh, and then obviously safety of, of those folks. Yeah, Jay, in, in line with the point that uh, Commissioner Simon was making, I know that uh, we are in this whole COVID environment where we talk about distancing and a number of other things that uh, go into that. And you kind of wonder what's going to carry over in terms of permanency, in terms of the way we look at buildings and layout and space. And uh, I know it's a challenge. Um, because, you know, the, the notion, for example, uh, these temperature readers, uh, I've been going to the hospital quite a bit recently, and uh, I find these temperature readers are pretty, are pretty, are pretty interesting. You just walk up, face up, and it takes your temperature right away, and you can go into the building. So I hope that, to me, that's good, sound planning thinking. Uh, for any space going forward, because while we're in an immediacy of a COVID, we, that could have remnants that carry on for years, you know, and so it should be factored, I think, into our design planning. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, and I've seen those, those as well. Um, it's all hands-free, uh, and, um, and they, they either do it through facial uh, temperature scan off your forehead, um, or, or I've seen them actually on your wrist as well, which I think are a little less, less, um, um, less accurate probably. Um, but, um, but I hear you, you know, that those are thoughts and, and the impact both to the service center as well as the lobby and how it functions um, and, and that impact from COVID uh, and what lasting impacts that's gonna have, I, I don't think is 100% known yet but, but there are certainly thoughts and, and, and we've been trying to have the design remain flexible and, and um, uh, to, to respond to that. And, and Jay, on, on the um, lobby area, that's a tremendous amount of space being committed to virtually no use. Um, and, and I would hope that again, it could be friendlier and um, a more human scale, um, maybe with small uh, small tables and, and chairs around it for people who are waiting for someone who is in an appointment or a reading nook for children or something, but to put that much cubic feet into open space, I think, is an over dedication of, of space, whether you put a balcony across to provide some more uses in that area, but um, I would prefer to see some, some good use made of that space as well. It can be open and clearer, but I think it should be warmer than just the walls and the staircase. So. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, and I I know the slide on page twenty nine uh, is is stark. I mean, it it certainly um, is. You know, there's two chairs with a with a table and not much else. And recognize that it's very early in their sure. in their designing. Um, and well, better really to get just, the. Uh, Better to get the ideas early in, or at least the opinions, so they can go into the thought processes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, so, and these are great ideas. Sort of related to that, uh, have, I haven't done it yet, but have, has anybody been in the new park and planning building? Yes. That, and what, is, what do they have in their um, atrium? Because I know they had originally planned something. Sort of um, I found it a very cold unwelcoming environment okay. um, and they've got exceedingly high-tech elevators and um, 
of course, they've got the COVID protocols going on, which affected some, but um, the parking, you have to walk around the building to get into the front door. And it, it just felt very cold and unwelcoming to me. Well, my, my point, I guess, related to your comments is that we ought to look at that and maybe even have conversations with DGS to yep. find out their experience, to learn whatever there is to learn uh, about new technology, new design, and the new reality. Yeah. The office levels were very, that I was in was, was very bright and f appeared to be very functional mm -hmm. um, and accessible, but I, I didn't find the I mean, access I mean, and entry welcoming at all. Were you, were you in the hearing room? No. No, I well, went again, straight to the permitting, permitting offices. And so, I think and, and it, the access is tightly controlled to yeah. the other floors yeah. by those elevators. Right. I think that um, there are things that we could learn from that, particularly yeah. also with, uh, they've got hearing room, which we're going to have. So we ought to look at that. Yeah, that one. Uh, several staff have toured the building. Um, prior to the actual opening. Uh, and, and we were able to see, you know, before they got the finishes in uh, the, the layout generally of that second floor, it, including the, the, the way that they were handling the space behind the hearing room um, for audio visual, but also for conference and, um, and galley. And they also had some office space. So some of that did help inform what we were looking at. Um, as well as also, you know, there, there were a couple of things that they were doing that we didn't like. Um, more to the office interior, the way it was left open, some, some things like that, that were really helpful and, and informative and for, for the process too. But we will reach out and, and see what's, what's working, what's not, um, what their experiences has been, and that'll help guide us as well. And also seeing it after the finishes would right. probably yeah. provide us a different perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, what, I, what, I, what I have found usually, Jay, is that there's a, sometimes a significant distance, difference between a government building standards and commercial building standards, especially related to open space. And part of it is a cost, a cost consideration, I understand. But we'd be better off if we could imitate sometimes the the, the uh, finer quality of some of our good commercial buildings in our government structures, okay? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. yep, okay. Um, okay, good. Well, thank you for those, the, those comments uh, and I've made a lot of notes. So we'll, we'll um, be sure that we incorporate them. Um, moving, moving, uh, on to the next segment here. It's the uh, slide 30, which is our pre-development um, budget. And I know there's a lot on this going on on the slide, but um, uh, basically back in May of uh, 2020, we approved a, a budget um, that was 2,650,150. Um, and after, after uh, some reallocations in the budget and then projecting out for the rest of calendar year 2021, um, the, there, there were a few items that are coming up that weren't included uh, in that original design. And so we're, we're going to ask for uh, an additional, um, ad additional increase to the, uh, to the pre-development budget. And that really is uh, accounting for the telecom and AV and security design uh, that, that has to occur some acoustics and lighting and environmental graphics designs um, that also are part of the, the design process. Um, there were uh, some slight increases to um, the, uh, the contingency and, uh, and also a little bit of the development fee um, because of the, the uh, time frame that we're talking about extending this through. Um, but it's a total of $258,150 um, that will take us all the way through uh, building permits, including, you know, and the last time we actually asked for uh, to bring those permit fees forward. And so those are included in here. 
Um, but that takes us all the way through the issuance of uh, those permit fees. And the next slide, page 31, in, uh, gives you an overview of the planning process. Um, we're currently in the second step here of mandatory referral. Um, the design documents will be um, underway and, and finished. Uh, then there are some additional steps for the planning board, which you'll see on page 32 of the process. Um, after they've approved the design and administrative subdivision, it still has to have a uh, record plat issued by the planning board and uh, DPS. And, and that's before you can um, have your civil permits and your building permits issued. And we are fully anticipating those occurring this year and that uh, construction would begin in January of 2022. When do we think construction period will be? Uh, right now it's a, a 24 month, um, but I know we, we've got a general contractor who's looking at pre-com um, right now to see uh, how long and if there's some really what that time frame is going to look like. Uh, and when we come to the commission next, we'll have some, some really good estimates, of, first of all, the cost and then also the, the time frame for construction. Uh, just make a note that we'd like to have our Christmas party in the building on December 2023. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> December, I'll write that down. Uh, all right, great. Yeah, me too. Um, so the slide 33 is really just the commission steps. Um, we will be back in front of the commission for um, the final design and review and approval. Um, we have to go through the process of selecting a general contractor. Uh, there's also the development and financing plan. And then of course, any other commission approvals uh, that, that may be needed that we're not thinking of at this moment. Um, and so the last slide really is just the authorization. Will the, will the development finance committee join staff's recommendation of the commission to uh, to, to allow the executive director to complete the mandatory referral application process, submitting um, the this, this second step. It also authorizes approval of the pre-development budget uh, up to 2,908,300. And, and the last item there is actually a, a, a typo. It's actually the third installment of the development budget funding. Um, it, we've, we've requested two previously and this is the third, actually. So my, my apologies, that was a miss site on mine, my part, and I'll fix that in the next go round. But um, we're, we are asking for additional pre amount funding of 750,000. That comes off the PNC line of credit of the 60 million uh, line of credit. Uh, Jay, can you go back to the earlier slide, the slide 33? Yeah. Um, I'm only asking you to go back there because I noticed that, the, I know these are, future commission approvals, but you're asking for, you look at uh, budget updates and design updates, and then you have final review, and then you have selection of general contractor. Now, um, my concern only is that I think that having the general contractor involved in the preparation of final budget numbers is an important thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, because I've seen it happen where the general contractor is selected, comes in and starts looking at your detailed joints and whatnot, and all of a sudden you're back with a change order or some change in your budget structure. Mm -hmm. so the earlier, I think the earlier you get your contractor involved in finalizing numbers, the better you are at the end of the day. Even though you might be going with a, a maximum price contract, uh, still you wanna have them in as early, I think as possible in that process. Mm -hmm. Well, agreed. Um, I, that, that selection is also for the, um, that's our, our, like you said, it's, a, it's the, uh, general contractor. We've got a pre-con, a pre-construction general contractor on board now, um, okay. and they are helping with some of the design decisions and giving us live feedback. Um, they haven't really. They've really just gotten going, and so they, they've um, they'll be really helpful as we get into our design document phase. Um, but um, but but I hear you. Yeah, we we really want them to be giving us that feedback uh, so that we know that there's constructability 
uh, and, and other issues taken care of before we get too far along. Yeah. Um, All right, thanks. Uh, two questions, Jay. Um, one is on the approval for the third installment of pre-development funding. Yeah. Uh, why do you have to come back to us every time you get, if we've approved the budget, we've approved the fact that it comes out of the uh, um, line, of, is it line of credit? 60 million. Uh, yeah. Why do you have to keep coming back every time you want to draw money? Uh, the, bank, the bank requires a resolution. Um, For each one? Well, if, if the commission had given us um, authorization to draw the full amount, then we wouldn't have to come back. But as is our uh, practice, we request drawdown in tranches. But if, if our resolution approve the full amount, it doesn't preclude you from drawing it down in crunches, does it? Does not. It does I mean, not. I, just, I just think that uh, we go through a lot of the review of your stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we've settled on a budget. Mm -hmm. We've settled where the money's coming from. Mm -hmm. And it, to me, seems logical that we would approve a resolution that authorizes you to get that money as you need it. And then we still go through all this other stuff. But, and that's something for you guys to think about. Yeah, what we, what we can do here with the revised budget, um, we can um, do a resolution that takes resolution care of the rest of it. For the, yeah, for the full yeah. amount. And then, I think, okay. I would suggest you think about that. Sure. Uh, the second question I had is there uh, any progress on the solar stuff? that we should talk about now or is it later? Um, we, um, we should probably <laughs> talk about it later. later. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but we are working on it. Yeah, we're All just right. still in sort of staff to staff. Okay. Yep. I have a question about access to the building and the streets and the traffic on 2nd Avenue. Um, at the present time, the Commission on People with Disabilities is struggling to find a way to improve, and I believe they're working with park and planning, but the way that bicycle lanes have been installed in a number of the, um, and bus stops have posed a, a real hazard and difficulty for people with sight impairments and a real safety issue. And I would hope both because of this development and Holly Hall and uh, West Side Shady Grove that we check in with the Commission for People with Disabilities and get an understanding of the challenge that people um, are having by splitting up or putting the bicycle lane be between the curb and the um, travel lane and where the bus stops. Um, and I know that the transportation area at West Side particularly is um, under review. So if you can, if you can um, please consult with them and just find out where they are in those studies and, and understand the issue from their point of view um, as we look at each of these developments now so that we don't later either experience complaints or um, if we can reduce the, this, the potential for hazards and accidents, I'd really appreciate that. Thank you. Yep, will do. Yep, that's great. Um, are there other questions or comments of the staff or is there a motion to approve 
Um, I was going to I was going to move approval of the uh, that we support the staff recommendation to the commission. And is I there second. a second? I second that. It's been moved and seconded. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 The recommendations of the staff are approved. Um, this is an exciting adventure. I think there will be considerable interaction between our other properties in that neighborhood and our headquarters. And so I think particularly that intersection and that area is key. And I would just comment, I was in Rockville yesterday and amazed at how um, the town center development is awesome. really up there. Have we topped out yet? Or we're close, I would think, if not. Very close. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's really mm -hmm. exciting. Yeah, and they're working uh, on the lower floors inside. Uh, and it's, the progress there is, is really going quickly. Um, and so we, we get to walk uh, some of the first mock-up units uh, just, just for the overall layouts um, next week. So uh, wow. from that point on, yeah, the units will finish out and yeah, it's pretty exciting how quickly they're going. Awesome. You know, it, in line with that, it would really be nice if and this is uh, something down the road, and not tomorrow, but that we had a way that that you could post onto our website or something progressive pictures as developments are underway, and see mm -hmm. we could see it and the community could see it. So it's just not a project that gets approved, then we don't see it again until we walk into it for the opening. So it'd yeah. be nice to be so progressive pictures. That would be really nice to do. Isn't there a live camera? Um, oh, and, oh, there are webcams. Yeah, can we? Is that does that make sense to have a link to the the live? cameras? Maybe? Sounds yeah. good to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, we had done some of that at Elizabeth Square. Yep. Are we yep. still doing it? Yep. I hadn't yep. checked recently. I check, I check like every week on these because it's exciting, so. Okay. Well, I think that would be helpful. Sure. Okay. And good. we're doing the redo of the website right now, so we'll uh, talk to them about how integration might work. Wonderful. That'd be great. That's great. Is there other business to come before the committee? Not today. This Any comments from my commissioner, fellow commissioners? Questions, discussion okay. items? Keep up the good work. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will. Hearing no further business to come before us. Um, May I have a motion to adjourn? I move. Seconded. <laughs>